I'm Nate Strong. I serve as executive director of the Royal Lincoln County Community Improvement Corporation. Um, and tonight we're talking a little bit about the role of population and economic growth here in Central Ohio. Um, newsflash, we're growing in, in Central Ohio. Uh, and so really want to start the conversation tonight, we really want to talk a little bit about the role of growth. What does that look like? Talk about our communities, whether it be townships, villages, cities, school districts. Uh, be better prepared for some of this growth. What does it look like? Um, and how can we better manage it long term? Uh, ultimately, you know, our office serves as the tip of the spear when it comes to economic growth here in Looking County. And I can tell you point blank, uh, when we do our site selection, when we work with our companies and our RFIs and our RFPs and our conversations, they want to know where our workers are. They want to understand what does that look like? What kind of skills do they have? And are you growing or are you shrinking? If you're in a shrinking community, they don't want to go there. They're looking at what that demographic looks like. Are you on the right side of 40 or the wrong side of 40? Even if not well, we always look at those numbers. So I really want to thank you all for tonight for coming out. Um, Jennifer, where are you, my friend? We're going to start the evening with Jennifer Knoll. Jennifer um, works for the Minnesota Regional Planning Commission. I'll let her do her own introduction about a little slideshow in. Uh, Jennifer, do you want to come up? everyone at Girl Lincoln County for hosting us this evening. I'm really pleased to be here with you to kick things off. Um, we've got a lot of really cool stuff to talk about, so it's very exciting to be a part of it. As Nate mentioned, I'm Jennifer Knoll. I'm a principal planner with the Mid-Ohio Regional Planning Commission, or MORPSI. We're based in Columbus. Um, and my role varies. I get the opportunity to work on a, a lot of different things as a planner in the Department of Planning and Sustainability. We're going to be talking primarily about Insight 2050 and some of the work that we've done for our scenario analyses over the last several years. We also have the luxury of working on our Sustainable 2050 program, which assists our local governments and regional organizations towards some of their sustainability efforts. And we also work on active transportation and transportation safety on my team. So I see me who's all pulled up here. So without further ado, I've been doing this for years. So for those who aren't familiar with Morpsey, we are the regional council for, for Central Ohio. Um, we have a 15-county area of service, as you see on the map, and we are the federally designated metropolitan planning organization for the communities within that orange boundary that it may be a little bit difficult to see, but essentially in the center of the map. So we have 70 members that are primarily local governments as well as regional organizations, and our mission at Morpsey is to bring our members together, to bring communities and organizations together, really to help us all prepare for uh, a vibrant future for this growing region. We do that through a lot of different ways. You've heard me talk about just a couple of them just within the work of my team. The one that we're going to focus on tonight is Insight 20. And so I think the reason Nate really asked if I would kick things off tonight, as he alluded to, the cat's out of the bag. This is a growing region, and we are growing quite a bit. So with Insight 2050, we looked at the seven county region that you see in the top right of your screen there, so Franklin County and the six adjacent. What we're finding is that by the time we get to 2050, we have the potential to grow substantially. In 2018, that region was just under 2 million. We're around 2 million people right now. We can grow, in a conservative estimate, upwards of 600,000 people, but the reality is that we have the potential to grow even more than that. Four of the last 10 years have been record-breaking growth years for Central Ohio, so if those trends continue, we could very easily become a region of 3 million people by the time we get to 2050. And we're, only, we're not only talking about people, we're also talking about the homes and the jobs that those people are going to need to sustain themselves and their families. So those are the numbers that you see in those other bars. So I brought along some slides just to show you really what we're talking about here in Lincoln County and drilling down a little bit as to where that growth is allocated. So this is showing population projections for the county of 2050. I apologize, I know it's hard to see, but Lincoln County, you're growing too. And so we're estimating upwards of over 43,000 people by the time we get to 2050. That's a pretty significantly sized city that Lincoln County is going to add in the next 30 years. And so, of course, that's going to come with households and jobs as well. So we're projecting, based on that number of people, that we would see over 16,000 new households. So here's an 
interesting thing with Looking County, and we'll talk more about this in a minute. A lot of the demographic changes that we're seeing are really primarily toward the baby boomers who are moving into their retirement years, so we're going to have a growing number of older adults, and among young people, so millennials and Gen Z. We've got a lot of those that are the largest and most diverse generations in our country, and we've got our share of those here in Central Ohio. What's really interesting in Licking County is we're actually seeing a lot more kind of single family growth than we might see in some of our other surrounding counties. So what this information is telling us, these households were projected to be a little bit bigger, three and four person households, as opposed to the smaller, maybe two point-ish households that we're expecting to see in, say, Franklin County. So what that tells me is there's a lot of folks who view Licking County as a very great place to raise a family. So that's an important consideration for the job market, important consideration for schools as well. Jobs, here we go. I think this shows us just over 13,000, yeah, 13.2 thousand jobs that we're anticipating for Licking County, which makes sense because we know we've got that number of people coming. And so thinking tonight with some of the information that I'll be talking about and some of the presenters will be talking about as well, how do we anticipate this growing number of jobs? What are those sectors going to look like? And how do we prepare to ensure that the county is ready to meet that demand? So I wanted to bring along, uh, just for comparison, to show you where Lincoln County fits into the 15 county region. So this is all 15 counties that Morsi serves. Um, obviously, Franklin County there is on the far right. It's our largest county, and you know, it, that is what it is. But if you take a look, that pink bar there, the third one in from the right, that's Lincoln County. So Lincoln is far and away one of the largest counties within our area of service. And if we remove Franklin County and go to the next slide, we can see just how much of a share of the region's population the county truly has. So Lincoln County accommodating for just over uh, 1.08 million people and just over 16% of the population when we from those estimates. Within our membership, so the cities, townships, and villages that comprise one membership, all the communities in Lincoln County are growing. So we've got Newark, Newark highlighted in yellow. Pascal, I'm really sorry, I don't know why we missed you, but you're also one of the growing communities here. Um, I'm gonna run the arrow over here if you can see. Um, maybe I can't do that. Right here. Thank you. So right where Nate is covering, the Tascala, that's where you are at this too. So both of the cities here in Newark, in, in Licking County who are our members are experiencing growth. We'll go to the next slide to show that that's happening in our townships and in our villages as well. So Granville and the townships, and then Johnstown there near that yellow bar second from the right. So these are among our, our largest and some of our fastest growing communities across the region or right here in Licking County. The interesting thing about growth in Central Ohio is that it's not actually new for us. We've been doing this decade over decade for the last several decades. The thing that is really fascinating this time around, and what we actually really encourage our local governments, our communities and organizations to think about, is the demographic changes that are underlying that growth. That's actually quite different from what we've experienced in the past, and it's driving some really big shifts in the market, both in terms of real estate and economic development. So we are getting both older and younger. I touched on this earlier when I mentioned the baby boomers. You can see, especially on those two bars on the right, what that's showing us is that as we move toward 2030 and then eventually toward 2050, but with the pace of the baby boomers, as we move toward 2030, there's gonna be more and more of them moving into those retirement years. And thankfully, we're living longer today as well. So we're gonna have a pretty significant share of our region's growth that's made up of those older adults. As we get closer to 2050, it's really going to be those millennials and the Gen Zers that are taking over. And so that's what you start to see in that blue shaded area, that 47% of our region's growth by 2050 is going to be among those young people today who are going to be in their family raising years in 2050. And looking happy, because we're looking at those household projections, we can assume that you guys are going to have a pretty good share of folks that age, because those are going to be the people raising their kids here at Looking Happy. What we're finding to be really interesting is that regardless of the age, the preferences are starting to shift. And it can all be summarized in really a single sentence. We want to be near more places, and we're going to move to the next slide for the second half of that sentence. We want more options to get there. So really what this is saying is people are increasingly willing to give up size and space to be closer to the places that we want to go. And today, the idea of having a single occupancy vehicle, our own personal car, for some of us that might seem earth-shattering because we've depended on it since we were 16, it's 
especially for young people today, that's less and less a priority because mobility as a service is starting to take over. We can now use an app and dial up mobility on demand. Maybe that's an Uber or a Lyft, or maybe you're lucky enough to live near a bike chair or an electric scooter. And so you no longer need that personal vehicle today the way folks did uh, you know, even 10 years ago, let alone 20 or 30. So of course all this is changing market demand, right? And we know it, we're experiencing it, we're seeing it already. But these are some of the common threads that we're starting to see among our communities. The desire for more walkable, connected neighborhoods. We want to live closer to the places that we like to go. We want more transportation choices. Uh, no one wants to sit in rush hour traffic. Please give me an option so I don't have to do that. Mixed use environments are really integrated uses within our neighborhoods. Um, Subdivisions and cul-de-sacs have a really important purpose for raising our families um, and for providing that kind of separation so it's a little bit safer in some ways for our kids. But there's also something nice about being able to walk across the street to go to a restaurant, to pick up something at the grocery store. And so increasingly, we're seeing a demand for that kind of product. I think really largely thanks to our baby boomers, we're starting to see a growing desire for homes that are maybe smaller, but I would say really more or less maintenance. And so we're starting to see the rise of the condo community. Uh, and then we're also starting to see a lot more interest in more diverse communities, whether that's mixed age, mixed income, but uh, in particular, our young professionals are looking for more diverse communities. And we see a lot of local examples of that too. This is not just downtown Columbus that we're talking about. This is communities all across the region. I think New Albany and New York are two really good examples of where we're starting to see that return to the connected neighborhoods. So this is creating a lot of ripple effects throughout our communities. Obviously, the big one is housing. Um, if you've heard me talk about this before, I always say the same thing. The demand for single family homes is not going away, and we don't want it to. Central Ohio is a great place to raise a family, and we want it to stay that way. But what we're finding is that those communities that can offer options, be that apartments, condos, or smaller single family homes, those are the communities that are going to be most competitive going forward, because they're able to attract and retain residents. So for baby boomers, those that are looking to move into those Maiden Street condos, they love their neighborhoods. They don't necessarily want to leave, but do they have that product that they can move into? If so, that's great, because now you've freed up that home for the young family that wants to move in to raise their kids. But that young family is probably not necessarily starting in a home. So do they have an apartment that they can rent in your community? Can that be the last rental that they have, and then they move into their first home in that same community? Believe it or not, in a lot of places across our region, that's a really difficult thing to find. Infrastructure is a big one, and it's not necessarily one we think about. So the reality is we're growing. There's going to be more of us here in the region. And a lot of us want to live closer to the places that we go. So this is going to naturally, gently increase the density of our communities across central Ohio. So we really have to be thinking, and what we certainly urge our communities to think about is, can our roads support more people? If we don't want to sit in as much congested traffic, but we've got a million more residents, are we creating options so that folks don't have to drive everywhere? Do we have options for public transportation? Do we have sidewalks? Do we have safe bike passage? These are the kinds of things that we have to be thinking about and implementing now to support the growth that we're going to have in 20, 30 years. And then obviously another big factor is economic development. I think he touched on this a little bit in his introduction. The reality is that for many of us, when we were looking for a job, we were looking for the job. And the way employers recruited talent was to tell you how great the job and the benefits were. And regardless of where that was, we went to it. Um, the reality is that is really shifting. And so in particular among young professionals, they're far more interested in being where they want to be. They're just assuming the job is going to fall. And in a market like we've got today, they might be right. And so the reality is that employers have to be thinking about this. They've got to go where their talent is. And so it's helpful as an employer if you can be located in the kind of dynamic place where your young professionals want to be. And so that's a big shift, paradigm shift that we're seeing across the region. So these are all the factors that we were considering even 10 years ago. But as recently as 2013, when we got together with our partners at the Columbus District Council of the Urban Land Institute, which is a nonprofit for real estate and land use professionals in Columbus 2020, which is our regional economic development arm, um, because we're all kind of facing these same issues. We might approach them a little bit differently, but the reality is the more we can collaborate on these things today, the better off we're going to be as a region. 
And so that was how Insight 2050 was born. How can we present this information, give our communities and organizations the information that they need to make decisions that are right for them? Some of you may have seen this before. At the heart of Insight 2050 is this scenario analysis. So we asked the question, what will Central Ohio look like in 2050 based on the decisions that we made today? And so we created these four scenarios to answer that question. Scenario A, this is our past trends hypothetical. This is what the region could have looked like in 2050 if communities had never adopted land use plans. <coughs> Many of our communities do have land use plans in place, and so scenario B, or plan future, takes those into account. Then we start to see a shift with scenarios C and D. What if we started to accommodate for some of that growing preference for the more connected, walkable development patterns that we see? Focus growth takes that into account by looking at opportunities for infill and redevelopment where it's appropriate. Scenario D takes that pretty far and says, what if you only developed where you had existing infrastructure today? I would say that's probably a hypothetical situation for us as well. And so we took those four scenarios and we ran them through. Yeah, right. No, you're good, you're good. <laughs> we ran them through these eight metrics that you see here. So this is what allows us to actually answer that question in real numbers. We can determine the actual cost of our development and mobility decisions um, with some pretty good estimation just by taking a look at the scenario analysis. So these range from things like how much more land would we need to consume for development? How many more vehicle miles would we travel as a region? Um, can we save households money based on this issue? So we looked at all of these, and what we found is as we start to make that shift toward the more focused approach to growth, infill and redevelopment, we see benefits across all eight of these metrics. And so that was really um, eye-opening for a lot of us to take a look at that information and realize that the choices that we're making truly do have impacts for us down the road. Those who are familiar with the original Insight 2050 study might have been finding themselves, especially in the last couple of years, asking, what about mobility? Um, because growth has been happening even faster than it was when we did that original study, it's become really apparent that we need to start to get in front of our transportation challenges as a region. And so with that accelerated growth, we decided to take a closer look at mobility. That's how Insight 2050 border concepts was born. I wanted to show this slide because I think it's that public-private partnership, the collaborative spirit of these projects that has really helped to drive their success um, across the region. So these are the partners that were involved in this corridor concept study. So we took what we learned from Insight 2050 and we applied it to this idea of, okay, we know there's an option for focused growth. We also know that we're kind of on a trajectory that's maybe not quite there yet. What does that mean for us in 2050 in terms of how we get around? Can we support better transportation options by making some decisions today? So on the left is the current trajectory. This is based on the plans that are in place today. Fairly suburban style growth. We don't have a dedicated right of way for transit today. And so what we see is density is fairly low. We're fairly spread out. We don't have a dedicated right of way for 50 either. So there's not a lot of options for transit. Compared to the right, what I really want to point out here is that for the purposes of study, we selected five quarters. These were based on some overlaps between Morpsey's long range transportation planning as well as efforts from CODA and Columbus. We selected the five quarters that you see here, but the entire point of the study was to find um, similarities, typologies along each of these quarters. So even if it wasn't, even if your community is not along one of the quarters studied, you can take the results and replicate them in your community if that's of interest to you. So for example, 161 to Newark and Granville, this is obviously a pretty big commuter route. There's a lot of things that happen here logistically jobs wise and so obviously that's the kind of um, corridor that would be worthy of studying and we think that we can apply some of the lessons learned from this initial corridor concepts to 161 and some of the other corridors that exist around here. What we found is that if you take that focused approach to growth and you start to move more of the growth and development into corridors, there's a lot of opportunity to capture some of that investment. Um, you also have the opportunity to really improve the, the future of transportation. By dedicating right-of-way, we can start to think about high-capacity transit in particular, which allows us to move even more people faster and more efficiently than we're able to do it today. So those are just some of the benefits that we found with this study. And the reality is that the benefits are not only for those who live in the corridors, but they are across the region. We see higher tax revenues per acre. As a region, we spent $10 billion fewer dollars on infrastructure. There are a lot of things that can come um, out of this kind of focused approach to growth that can really benefit all of us. But this doesn't happen alone. It takes jurisdictional collaboration. 
we're lucky here in Central Ohio that we have the Columbus Way, and that's really going to be the kind of thing that's going to inspire something like a corridor concept to happen down the road. The last thing I wanted to talk briefly with you about today is that if we're thinking about mobility and growth and higher density, we also have to be realistic about some of the housing challenges that we're facing as a region today. Um, that could potentially only get a little bit more challenging if we're not thoughtful about what we do about it. And so as we go, can we provide more and better housing options for our region? So we just last week kicked off the regional housing strategy. This is an effort that North is once again leading with our partners. Yeah, okay, we'll get to that slide. So, <laughs> there's already been a lot of interesting work that's been done in this space. We know from efforts from the BIA, which is where this, this image is from, as well as the Affordable Housing Alliance of Central Ohio, we do not have enough housing to meet demand in Central Ohio today. Um, and that is not just affecting people who are lower income, it's not just affecting renters, it is affecting both renters and homeowners at every household income price point. So the reality is we need to build more and we need to build more options. But how we get there is the challenge, right? Um, and so what we want to do with the regional housing strategy is explore this through the lens of regulation and policies as well as financial incentives and economic development to really get a sense of what existing conditions are for Central Ohio, but also what kind of strategies would make sense for our region in order to move the needle and produce the enough supply to meet the demand. So this is what we hope to produce, this coordinated housing strategy that develops investment and policy recommendations to support mixed income neighborhoods and regional growth. And our goal throughout this process is to foster a housing market where every household with a full-time wage earner can obtain housing in the private market. But we realize that not every household has a full-time wage earner. There are different definitions of what that would even mean in order to be able to buy housing in the private market or to rent in the private market. And so we want to be sure that the strategies that we offer through this process also help to supplement the market where we cannot reach that first goal. Morsi is not an expert in this space, and we know it. There's a lot of things we do well, but we are not housing experts. And so we are really relying on a very solid team of consultants to help us through this process. Um, if you're not familiar with enterprise communities, they are nationally known for their work in housing. We've got some great local folks, including Ice Miller, Rayma, and both Strategic Insights, who are going to be with us every step of the way as well. And again, just to point out, this is once again a very collaborative effort. Um, it is really exciting to see how many local governments have come to us, raised their hand, and said, this is an issue that we want to get in front of. That includes Looking County, so we thank you for being part of this process with us. And to point out, this also includes several members of the business community, too. Housing affects all of us. It's something that we all need to be focusing on so that we can get in front of these challenges before we um, face some of the issues that we're seeing in some cities that are a few years ahead of us. So this is where we're headed next. I hope this tees up some of our speakers today as well. I think that's my last slide. Thank you. Uh, so real quick, we usually kind of hold Q&A to the end, but while it's all fresh in your head, if anyone have any additional questions for Jennifer to face in our presentation, I can bring the microphone to you. Don't be scared of the microphone. <laughs> Susan, you moved. <laughs> it's like an option. Yeah. Nate, is the... Get the microphone. I, pre I presume that the collaborators are also going to be able to find some sources of dollars to go with this. Uh, state, federal, local housing trust fund, just pointing out some ideas. Yes, thank you for your ideas. <laughs> yes, so that is one of the goals. We do want to, thank you, we do want to understand how best to leverage the funds that have been set aside in Columbus and Franklin County, but we also want to understand what more can be done for the six um, adjacent counties too, and so that will be a big piece of this. I'll add in that real quick just because well, you saw Lincoln County's uh, collaborator on that last part. Uh, Chris Hartman's myself and a few others here locally are involved in that conversation. And so we hope to bring kind of an insight of what's going on economically in our community, uh, understanding where our drivers are and where our, our holes are, uh, and how we fill them and back those opportunities. So my thinking high schools, I guess I'm interested to know where the intersection is with the public schools. Um, part of my school district's in Pasco, obviously fast growing area. We have a school district that as of today have 
4,720 students in the school district, and our building capacity total is 3,808. Now, if you look at our district report card, what's happened, we had all A's and D's years ago, and then you put, you know, so many kids in the space, we have a brand new high school coming online, but where is the education environment in the students? If you don't have a strong background or a strong support system with your educational system, all this is going to fail. That's a great question. It's also probably the question I'm asked most frequently looking Delaware and Union counties uh, because every one of those communities, many of those communities are really facing that same challenge. The reality is it is a very complex situation. Um, and so we've worked with our partners in the school districts to try to get a better sense of what your challenges are so that we can be cognizant of those as we go through the process. We've been discussing with the consultants about to what extent this first phase of the housing strategy can answer those questions or do we actually need to be realistic and consider potentially a second phase that's truly focused on how we engage with the school districts for those like yourselves that are facing uh, population overload, for others that are shrinking and have the opposite problems, how do we meet the middle with strategies that can work? So it's a great question. I'm sure we're, we're not here to get the instructions, we're here to help. But we have instructors, the city suffers from this as well. So we, we need to sit down with them here because we are all suffering from this. Right, the sheet being willing to participate. We're always here. Like I said, we look at those numbers more. We have a uh, high school middle school right now, 138 average, 138% average. Right now, it's not safe. You took a picture of your last slide, so what do you call it? Not your instructions, we're here to help, but we've got to work on this together. I think one thing that would help all communities involved is if we get on our state legislature to do something about school funding instead of being funded all on the local level. You know, we get some support, but we have a uh, certain amount of tax dollars coming from the state and we would count on that the communities would be a lot more open to accept these affordable housing and things. Give me the mic next. <laughs> <laughs> and with that, Representative Scott Ryan. <laughs> <laughs> They don't come from the person sitting right next to me. <laughs> no, it's all good. Um, I would just like to make a commercial for the uh, Patterson education plan that many of us worked very hard on over the last year, or year and a half. Would be much more, um, would recognize community growth, much like we can take situation, uh, much better than the current plan. The, the Cup Patterson plan is not perfect. It is light years better than what we have now. So I would beg everyone to please contact the Your office. Leader, leadership, my office, <laughs> leadership in the House and Senate, and please help. We're, we're closer than we've been in decades, and I'm not going to say fixing, but to vastly improving school funding. Um, it's not cheap. It's not perfect. There are people that in our state that won't like it, but I, I just cannot emphasize enough that this this plan was um, prepared and the, the meat of it was put together by school administrators and treasurers. This was not a legislative thing that's trying to be jammed out everyone's throat. This was much more of a what works for you, what you need, what does it cost to educate a child. So again, trust me, your calls and letters and emails to the legislature are more impactful than you probably realize. And so I don't like to beg, but I'm begging you to please help us get this thing moving because it's, it's very close to, to get across the finish line. I think it will help us with, with these growth problems. Join us. What's the governor say? Yeah. Uh, I stayed very gross city. I, I want to go back to that because I don't think the system is designed for city school system partnerships. The system not the intent, but the system. And I'll give you an example. We want to give a million five hundred thousand dollars piece of land through their school system, but we want to finance it. You cannot finance and give the school district the, 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 the land. What kind of rule is that? The other one is the win-win, which I know doesn't impact you, but we have children who live within walking distance of some school and are going to be bused four miles to another school. So the, the system, and I appreciate what, what, the, what the good representatives are coming, coming, coming from, because I think from your standpoint, and what the state is doing, it, it is very, very helpful. 
but there's still a flaw in just what are common sense items and, and make it work. We have a great relationship with schools. Uh, we use two of their buildings full time and uh, it, it works, but a lot of tinkering around they've been done. Thank you, Rick. Councilman Harris lagged into the last comment on the Piedmont program. Fisher, sorry. <laughs> so, for Newark, um, we have a lot of housing stock that need revitalized. And so, when it comes to the condos and the apartments and the mixed use facilities, we absolutely see that on our side. But when it comes to community reinvestment areas and tips, is there anything else that you'd recommend from the city to do to revitalize areas and increase the housing stock? That's a really good question. That's actually a piece that we're going to be taking. We're going to be taking a look at that piece for the regional housing strategy. We want to understand it um, because I think that that's a key piece to, to this, right? There's a lot of supply out there that just needs a little bit of TLC, right? And so we want to look at what's maybe some best practices from around the country. Surely there might be some examples of things that are working well locally too. So we want to capitalize on that. But there are other places that we can learn from too. So what makes sense to bring back this and all that? That's the kind of thing that I'm actually particularly interested in. So hopefully we'll get some good insights from that. Well, thank you, Jennifer. We'll have her around a little bit so everyone wants to get out of the conversation after the session. But thank you so much for your insights and your presentation. The Building Industry Association Central Ohio, uh, Joe Thomas, got him. Uh, Jim, where are you from? Oh, okay. Hey. Right, Hop up on the stage, Mayor, you're up as well on the stage, my friend. Uh, and there's stairs over here. Don't jump on the stage. Uh, I'm going to be John Paul. Let's open it up. And thanks for all of you for the opportunity to be here today. I've been around with these three enough to know that I can walk around with a microphone and they can project a little better, but we'll try to tag here. So let's jump right in, and uh, I, I'll give these gentlemen a few uh, seconds to introduce themselves. I'm John Melkar with BIA Central Ohio. BIA is in its 75th year of representing the residential construction industry in Central Ohio, and that includes uh, parts of Lincoln County, and we're thrilled to be here. Uh, we commissioned a study um, last year that some of you may have heard about that showed that there was a housing sh shortage in the region. We should be in the region building about 14,000 units per year. We're currently building eight. Um, that puts us at a economic deficiency when you compare it to the regions that we're competing against, such as um, Charlotte, Nashville, Austin, Texas, et cetera. Uh, one thing I'll highlight really quick as we talk about the school districts, the state of Ohio has, I believe, 660 school districts. The state of Colorado has 112. Uh, Charlotte has only countywide schools, uh, as does most of the South that we compete with. Um, so that is a different dynamic that we face in Central Ohio. And a governing magazine study just showed that the Columbus metro area has the third most government entities per 10,000 people in the United States of America. <laughs> and I sent that, that article to Bill Murdoch in Orpsy, and he said, good thing they undercounted us a little bit. So, <laughs> so with that, I'm going to pass the microphone to our panel and let them introduce themselves. Uh, good evening, Joe Thomas with Metro Development. I uh, exclusively build a multifamily in Central Ohio. Uh, good evening, Jim Lipnell, President of Homeward Corporation. I work on the land development side predominantly in single family and multifamily uh, residential development. Uh, I stayed Mary Rose and I have not been there forever. Some people <laughs> assume that I have not been there forever. Uh, retired from the National Bank. And during part of that time, I was running concurrent with the mayor, so uh, it's, it's not life forever with the mayor. <laughs> Thank you. So, Mayor, let's get started with you. While you haven't been mayor forever, you have been mayor for a significant period of time in which Grove City has been one of the fastest growing cities uh, and areas in central Ohio, both economically and population wise. How important is it for you as a mayor to balance? economic development, recruiting businesses, and taking housing into account as part of that component? Well, that's a, a half an hour 
our discussion. <laughs> Jennifer did an outstanding job, by the way, and I appreciate uh, the, this forum because it, it, really, it is really important to have communication for all the enemies. And in our case, uh, we, we started out on the economic job creation side, I would say, uh, by making sure that we have office parts identified throughout our community that if somebody wants to come in and do economic development on a commercial industrial side, we've identified where they should go. We did that back in the early 80s. And it worked. We had five different sites set, four of them worked. Well, then you start working on, and, and, and I brought our door for a plan, nobody I knew could see it. Where, where do you build things to make sure that you can anticipate the growth, whether it be commercial industrial or whether it be housing? So uh, we have uh, worked with this thoroughfare plan uh, since the early 80s. Uh, one road, for instance, we identified in 1986. It took us 20 years to build it, but it was perfect. It ran right parallel to I-71. Uh, it created over 5,000 new houses and a new shopping center and all those kinds of things. So planning, trying to be out front, making sure your services are in place. I mean, it, it's just, to me, about 70% of the battle and have a consensus. Um, schools have to be an extremely uh, key piece of that development. Uh, we're in a township. Uh, we've never uh, uh, divested ourselves from the township, so we work closely with them. And, and uh, being on the same page makes it work. But the housing, we've been patient, and that's tough to do. Because having diversified housing is really what will make the difference in the way we're going to look in 2050 going. By the way, Here's Grove City's 2050 plan. And, and we worked very hard on that and had a lot of uh, discussion with the citizens and, and some of our other partners. But having the plan in place, having the idea of how you want to grow up, being diversified, and then the other word that's easy to say but very difficult to execute is balance. You can ensure that you've got the right balance of housing and the right balance of job because they do run parallel. And, uh, you know, keep your fingers crossed. It is work. One of the questions we heard earlier had to do with schools, and uh, Mayor Stage talked about the importance of schools. Uh, from a developer standpoint, when you bring a new project to a municipality, I'm sure one of the entities that and discussions you have had is, is what is this impact on schools going to be? Joe, from a multifamily developer. Um, are there, are there, are you sometimes doing more explaining, listening, um, challenging what people believe? Uh, again, Joe Thomas, uh, that's interesting discussions because in our traditional <coughs> method of building in Central Ohio, we really had in the past very little interaction with schools. Um, however, over the years with the economic crunch that schools have experienced more and more every year. Of course, on the idea that they continue to have to pass levies with the residents in the area to continue to fund schools, we understood that maybe it's no longer an issue for us to just ignore. That we now have to involve the school districts that we want to work in and develop housing as a partnership uh, from the standpoint of first interaction with the school district before we even decide to do a development get necessary their input um, as far as the possibility that hey we have a great opportunity here for a development that has which in the multi-family world has little low, low impact on the school districts in the sense that we look at our numbers and we have data that shows we're roughly about 10 percent of our actual number of units has school-age children and it's so it's a average 240 unit apartment complex we see in our type of developments about 24 students so we look at that as how much money we invest into our property taxes as a multifamily developer and kind of run those numbers with the school districts that we work with and kind of show them the bonuses. We're not building office parks. We're not building office parks with high-end paying jobs that have little or no impact on uh, the school district. But we are doing housing, so we would like to show that partnership. So just to kind of run the numbers, if we have a community of 240 units, the tax property tax base of roughly 600,000. Portion of that, high portion of that goes to the school district. Let's say it's 475,000. 240 units, average cost to 
educate a school age child, children about, now some people might want to argue with this, about $10,000 on average. So the cost to educate that child that year for that particular area is like $240,000. So it is an excess of dollars that are generated from the multifamily side that can be helpful for the school district, but also generate you know, economic benefit for the entire region. So just to kind of summarize, it's now taking more collaboration between us developers as of a housing stock to work with the local area school districts. I, uh, I, I just want to add on that because uh, Joe's primarily multifamily. When we started a single family de uh, development or identify a site, we've gotten more in, it's not just schools, it impacts traffic um, and you know, community response, safety response. So we have to look at it a little bit differently and we, and we get together with all the parties involved. And where we've ended up, and where the, I think the future of the development is going, is really mixed use. So we end up, if we have 80 acres, doing a multiple uh, you know, mixed use development between sometimes a little bit of office, but definitely some component of either empty nester or multifamily along with the single family. And it's just like everything else, it's, it's the balance that you have to find. And so those discussions are becoming more and more upfront before we actually even decide whether we're going to purchase these properties. So you mentioned infrastructure, uh, traffic assessments um, and impact assessments on housing are um, a major component of how a site is developed. Uh, Mayor, I'll let you start from the Grove City perspective and your perspective. Uh, how do you balance the need for uh, kind of putting the cost on what this development should pay as its share and um, the view from some developers, I guess I'll let them bring this up, that uh, oftentimes developers feel that they're being asked to pay for sins from the past. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, you know, one of the things that we, we, we literally take every development as an opportunity. And, and I think that kind of mindset helps out in trying to figure out what are the components can make it work for everybody. And you're not going to satisfy everybody. But we, we use uh, some residential tips, and I know that, that, that makes somebody, some people squirm uh, the schools in Main Hole. But here's an example. We have a road that's literally an old cow path that uh, is a major thoroughfare in our community owned by the county. Now, we can't tell the county to repair that road, but if we go to them and say, here's our package of TIF funds that comes out of the, out of the, uh, out of the development, uh, here's our money that we're going to put into it to try to get the township to participate in it. And here's what we can do for the community as a whole, which is improve the particular roadway, uh, make it safer, put a bike trail, and do those kind of things. So we, we take each development and say, you know, what are the opportunities that can be the spillover from the standpoint of the community as a whole, not, you know, just develop? Jim, uh, well, I, I think initially when we get into the development and we start talking about, you know, what we, we call them off-site costs, road improvements, traffic uh, uh, improvements, pulling sanitary sewer, uh, you know, it's always best to get into a public-private where you work together. TIFs are, are a great vehicle, but they also have their shortfalls too. CDAs are great vehicles. Um, you're not familiar with that as a community development authority. Basically, adds that extra tax to the to the end user, the homeowner, uh, and then impacts. And, and those three, I think, there's a happy medium to get the three of them to work together to improve the area around the development uh, and make it not so it's not so burdensome, burdensome on the developer. So you know, the development cost, if you don't know, I've gone through the roof and probably tripled in the last ten years just alone. But I think working with the community is probably the right answer. Working with the schools on, on a, a three-pronged approach between CDAs, TIFs, and and Yeah, I would just second that and what Jim just stated as far as the public-private partnership. Uh, a lot of these infrastructure items that we now are impacted by as developers have become so overwhelming that you know a lot of it's driven by the historical background or the background traffic that was not necessarily part of the 
development that we're trying to build, but it's overall background traffic that creates these large infrastructure improvements that, you know, your economic models just don't support it on smaller developments, but maybe, like maybe you said in the past, it's the past sins that created these issues. So it does come down to that partnership with both public and private to make that happen. Jennifer talked about the need a little bit for, or, and showed the graph showing the need for need for housing across all spectrums. So let me ask these two because I know they get asked this often. Why can't you just build more affordable houses? <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, everybody knows the pieces and parts that go into the house. You've got the land, you've got the development of the lot, and then you've got the physical, you know, sticks and bricks still in the home. Uh, and you've got, work, I guess, fourth part, you've got the workforce. So, we've all heard about workforce development, you know, hard to get trades, it's a bit more difficult to build, it's driving costs up, you get a, uh, you know, a, a wildfire in California, prices of lumber goes up. All those things are a little bit out of our control, uh, although we try and, you know, wrangle them as best we can. Land prices, again, that's a supply and demand man issue. Our single biggest component that is driving up the cost of a developed lot, even before you put the house on it, is what I call project soft costs. They're anything from engineering, um, you know, uh, inspection fees. Uh, I think I paid in, in one other community, uh, I think 43000 for a rezoning application fee. Um, just in one development alone, or I, I said from 10 years ago, developing in the same community, the soft costs, which were the things I just mentioned, went from about three or $4,000 a lot that are now running about $12,000 a lot. So the, these are fees that you know, are, are now you know, mandated. And so we can't really do much with them, but what we can do is probably get more use out of the land. And Everybody doesn't like the word density because the first thing I come into a community with a plan, they look at it and say, it looks like you're just trying to do too much. Um, you know, and it's hard to combat that if the comprehensive plan actually calls for mixed use or higher density. But there's, there's a bit of a, a shift. Nobody wants the McMansion that they used to have in the one acre lot. The population, or at least the, the younger, the first time home buyers, I call it, are kind of looking for that smaller house, smaller lot, maybe even maintenance free where the HOA or something takes care of the, the landscaping for you. So you, know, you can have a smaller garage, you don't need a lawnmower and stuff. And so we're trying to get there. It's just hard when we go into communities and it's like, well, you need 15 foot side Um It's just very difficult to convince that the density and more open space, less roads, less roads to plow, a lot more open space, there's benefits of it all around, but people look at it and be like, you know, we don't want 50 foot wide lots, we want 80 foot wide lots. So, I'll say density. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, from a standpoint of affordable housing, um, you know, we look at it as the market, um, you know, we would all as developers would like to meet every market need as we possibly could, you know, from, you know, the lowest type of housing as far as price point to the highest type of but you know, as developers and as you know, in the in industry, as long as we have, we try to fit our product to the market, and that's ex exactly what we try to do. Is but, however, you know, from the standpoint of the affordable side, we understand that there's a large portion of the population that we would satisfy that need if we were able to, you know, our performance would, as we call it, pencil it out. And the thing that really um, detracts or the ability for us to do any type of affordable housing, as Jim alluded to, is not only the cost of construction on the hard cost, but the soft cost. Perfect example, um, I'm building now in the city of Delaware. I, I explicitly, not explicitly, more, more than not, our building has been in Columbus, Ohio. And from a sewer standpoint, on the sewer and water tap case in Columbus, Ohio, I'm maybe a thousand dollars per unit. I go up to the city of Delaware. Now my sewer tap fees are, and with water is ten thousand dollars per unit. So I've got a cost of over two million dollars just in sewer and water fees just for that development. So I've got the ability to go 
about 10 miles south, build the exact same development for roughly $10,000 less just on the sewer and water tap fees. They also have impact fees. That adds another $400,000 on the 240, 240 unit complex. So all those fees add up to where the actual affordable housing uh, scenario really is unreachable with those kind of scenarios. I, I want to go back to the question from North. Okay, here we go. We have infill in Grove City. About every community, I think, has infill. And I consider that an opportunity. Infill can be affordable housing. In some way, that gets well left on the side because the, the mindset is, well, the developers are going to build houses that you know are going to be quote affordable. But if you don't care, take care of your current stock, uh, you're going to be in trouble. We're all going to be in trouble. So what we do in Grove City, we've got our largest area that is the oldest part of our community in the CRA. And, and we've had an incredible response from people who are buying older houses, fixing them up, turning them. We have people who are building on four lots, multi-family. The, the multi-family is tax abated. And, and you have already existing infrastructure. You have already the, uh, the environment. You've got schools nearby and all the things you need to make affordable housing really work. So I, 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 use, I, I tread on that affordable housing pretty lightly as making sure you're looking at the big picture and, make, and, and making sure we're leveraging what we have currently. So, different view. Yeah. One last thing. I also look at the affordable housing as, as workforce housing, and that's more of a term I like to use because we've got young professionals moving into a community that we're trying to get their roots at. They, they typically pick a place when you start your job, you, you land in the community, you tend to have kids in that community, you tend to make friends in that community, or you have family in that community and you tend to stay. So the entry-level housing, the unprofessional housing, the affordable housing, whatever the term is, is vitally important to the growth and sustainability of the community. Come on. Okay, we've covered a lot of ground so far. Let's uh, open it up to the floor, see if there are any questions that, for the panel. Well, we've got them back, we can fire away from my list. I know you were a little bashful early on. Oh, there we go. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> getting to what you were saying about the infrastructure and stuff, I've been trying to advocate in our town is to give you developers a chance to come in and buy a piece of property and go on smaller lots, but you're going to have to convince the people to buy that. And they, don't, they want to come out in the country and buy five acres and tell a rancher or a farmer next door that's got 10,000 acres what to do. So, Buy 100 acres, put 75 or 100 houses on it, give them some green space, let them look out there and see that green space and say, I own it, and I'm going to have to take care of it. And put your infrastructure on a smaller place where it'll save you money, and you can build affordable housing. Which is primarily what we try to do. I mean, we kind of term it as, as conservation development, and we would love to do that. If we I, I think a lot of zoning boards are going to start listening more to you. And, and we pitched that proposal a lot. I think the last development that I just got, got approved has over 50% open space. I, I'm still being opposed by, by you know, the people that, that live around it. Not to mention that it's already up in that zone. It's already identified in the comprehensive plan as that mixed use development. We're not going over the density. We're kind of cramming it in a portion of it, leaving more open space. It doesn't get rid of the public perception that we're developing over the big bad developer and we're you know we're making a you know million dollars on a project. It's, it's a bit of the public perception that we're putting too many houses on a piece of land, although the comprehensive plan calls for it. We like to compact it. It's less street, it's less infrastructure. You know, the house is the house, you still got you know, two bathrooms, you still got a sewer tap, you got a garage. Those are kind of fixed costs, we're not going to change those. The, the density by able to do what I would call the conservation development is a great tool. But you've got to get community buy-in and the leadership in the community, the, the, the planning commission, the zoning commission, and the, the council of trustees need to know or understand that this is what they want and they need to explain that and get that word out, whether it's through the press or through their uh, council and township meetings, to get that word out and say this is why we need this. Because most people are just looking out their backyard and saying that used to be a farm field. I still want that to be a farm field. But for the betterment of everybody, 
it's not going to be remediable. Yeah, just quickly, the you know, the point about nobody's going to buy it. Uh, we had an infill project in the 90s, very early 90s, uh, the condo, uh, our world, our first time really going out of the condo world, aligned that type of development. Uh, the developer came in, put in 90 units, and within six months, 70% of the units were sold. 80% of the 70% were grocery residents. They wanted that smaller home, and they wanted to have the convenience of having a, a condo. Well, they sold out within a year. Uh, uh, two years later, I went back to the development and I said, you know, you got to build some more condos. This was a quote. I we built all the condos that I ever rebuilt in Gross City. Now, let me tell you something. We have a bunch of condos since then, and they have been back several times. But it is, you, you know, the speak about this density, uh, will people buy them, and it has worked, patio homes have worked, but you've got to have the right combination. Uh, it's your microphone. <laughs> and so, and, and I want to echo the mayor and some of the comments here about what this looks like. We have this in our community. This is not new to anyone. Um, and I'm going to look at right at Linda Nicodemus. Because we have football cottages in her community, in the village of Heber. And that project came online, it was planned four years ago, five years ago. Yeah. It was before my time as a plan, it, it ribbon cut while I was here. I think it's 100, uh, maybe 50. 50 units. Thank you. I want to give you the mic. I want you to talk about the whole project just for a second. Because this is a project that I'm really proud of in our community. And it's something that needs to be highlighted more. We had a developer come to us, um, and his thoughts were about workforce housing. So um, it is a tax um, abatement for. There's low impact tax right there. There's So, um, and we're right next to an industrial park. Of course, and the industrial park is right there. They got a buy-in from, we introduced them to several of the local industries. Um, they wrote them letters. Uh, the, develop, the, the development went in very easily. It's very nice community. It's one of the nicest apartment complexes that we've seen. It's almost like condos. It is. Yeah. And, uh, they have a clubhouse. They have a, a learning room in so that the um, industry can come in and teach and do training, job training in their community house. So it's been a very great addition to our community. And even before they had the first five units, but in the whole thing was sold out. And it hasn't been empty. They haven't had one empty space. And so when you talk to the developer about this project, that's why it's really critical to me. Every at this point, everything was rented out, was committed by the time they had a fifth unit filled. But what's really important to me is the economy of the MOUs. We had a memorandum of understanding with seven local employers to include information about this new development in the hiring pack for new employees in the industrial park. What does that do? That tells folks who are being hired in these facilities, they have opportunity to live close by. These houses are about a thousand feet or so from some of the major employers in the Hebron area. Here's the staff that broke me when I talked to the developer about this. Of those who moved into those units in that first phase, 60% live in the industrial park. Of that, half of them are driving more than 45 minutes to Hebron for work. What we've now done in this development is remove a barrier to workforce. We've eliminated that element that makes them want to drive that far. Now they're living in the community, they're investing in the community, and they're being able to adequately and accessibly get to a job. So I think that's really incredible. I know Nate's going to give me the. Uh, so you up here in a minute. Yeah, well, I, I don't want to stand between a gym and a microphone. That's a dangerous place to be. <laughs> 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 um, I will we'll end on something that I think uh, our panelists have uh, different perspectives on. Uh, one of the questions that I get are, are items that I've noticed is that zoning 
and uh, development issues before city councils have began and local municipalities have become so contentious. Uh, and part of this I blame Mark Zuckerberg and Facebook um, because a lot of keyboard warriors uh, get worked up and, and fired up. So, Mayor, how do you handle issues where members of your community are opposed to a project that you know to be good for Grove City and convince them otherwise? And similarly, I guess, uh, uh, Jim and Joe, if you have a funny anecdote to relay to the crowd so we can end on it, um, somewhat light note of, of something that you've encountered at a zoning meeting. <laughs> well, there have been several. Uh, we're working through one right now. As a matter of fact, uh, it's the one that's going to benefit the community as a whole by the ancillary uh, improvements that we made around a particular project. Uh, first, you, you really got to make sure you understand, the developer understands what some of those key points are. You're not going to say we solve all of it. You can get some home runs by doing what I consider very simple things. Uh, uh, bike trails, I mean, the connectivity and the ability to move throughout the community uh, means a lot. And it means a lot to everybody. Uh, sometimes the developers are, are not over uh, enthused about oversizing uh, uh, the, the sidewalks or doing whatever, but it, it, it does start mitigating those points. But uh, my class, is quite, uh, quite frankly, was don't anybody send this back to the city. Uh, I had an airplane that flew over uh, at the Fourth of July a number of years ago that said, "Take a high hike," because we wanted a major employer to come in. It was interfering with some of the people in this particular development. They did not want this major employer. By the way, it was 1,100 jobs. 1,100 jobs. And we fought that thing for nine months and finally started to pick away what are the things that are going to make the difference in the community. Trees was one of them. I don't want to see the place. Fine. Make the streets wider. I don't want to have to mess around with faster trucks where they came to be. But you got to, you got to dissect it. And then you have to communicate with the public as to what are the hot buttons and how to mitigate. I, I, I don't have a, a funny anecdote. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they're all very, you know, very personal. I take the heart sometimes. I feel like nobody likes me when I go to a planning <laughs> zone. But uh, everybody's familiar with the next door out or the next door kind of community bulletin board that's similar to Facebook. So uh, just by reading that on my own local community level, uh, there are the people living in houses, you know, very similar to mine that are like less than four years old complaining, stop building new houses, there's enough, you know. I, I look at that and I think like, I, why is it good enough for you to move in and not for anybody else to enjoy this community? It's a great place to live. Um, so that's why like, the public perception, we always try and do a good job of making sure we meet with adjacent neighbors let them know that, that I, I spent a lot of time with Columbus 2020, as I've explained earlier, uh, to get the economic growth data to, you know, to pitch my project of wow, the impact that will have in the community. Uh, only to have some audience members stand up and be like, well, we really don't want to be like Columbus anymore. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, you're missing the point of what Columbus 2020 is. But, so it's, it's hard to get that information out and get it understood by everybody. Right? They, they tend to hear what they want to hear. And if you don't talk to them, they're going to talk amongst themselves and get the wrong. Can you beat that? No, I, I can't. <laughs> so I've been doing this since probably 1996. Um, what I learned early in my career was you got to have a thick skin in this, in this occupation because you are going to hear a lot of stuff and it's personal. I did mention about you personally, about your life passion, about what you do for a living. and. You know, I think people miss the point is that it's not just up, us up there in front of these people. We're representing an organization that also represents a number of people. We employ in Central Ohio, you know, at any given time, 600, 700, 800 people. We invest, you know, millions of dollars in each community. But I guess from an anecdote, I had a project at the corner of Wilson and Trevue over in the city of Columbus. And uh, 
I tried to do my due diligence. I met with each neighbor. I met with all the residents. Uh, there was roughly 700 residents in the uh, community itself that was adjacent. I was buying a corner uh, lot of five acres. So uh, I went over to the Wilson uh, Golf Course, which was across the street, and I rented the, uh, the actual uh, banquet facility, and I set up 50 chairs. Walked in there, and uh, 50 chairs were already full, and they were moving the actual <laughs> divider behind the 50 chairs to expand the room, and ultimately they set up 250 chairs. So I realized I had my work cut out for me that evening, and that was the first meeting I had for that community. So from an antidote standpoint, just be prepared to do your homework. Thank you, and I'll turn it over to Nate, but I will end with this. As I like say at the BIA, remember, um, homes are where jobs go to at night, and uh, uh, people wanting to come to your community is a good problem to have. My colleagues across the state of Ohio wish they had these challenges. They wish they were part of the program. So thank you. Thank you. Personally, as a reform city planner myself, <laughs> yeah, I can. It's going to the stage. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> You're done. Okay. Okay. Chris deserves some time. <laughs> uh, next up is Jim Leiterman. Uh, Jim serves as the village manager for the village of Austin. And before I learn the slideshow, I just want to say this about Jim. I've known Jim. I was in 2004, and I was in an urban policy and politics class at State University. <laughs> and I remember sitting in the front, step, front row, and, and this really tall, lanky dude comes in from Virginia and starts talking about urban politics, planning, development, things that he's really doing that's really interesting. And I thought, man, that's like a really great career path. I'm going to do that. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, in all seriousness, Jim really did inspire me. When I was an undergrad, he was a Muslim graduate just like myself. Um, and so, he was really kind of, he was the first person who really gave me the idea of getting involved in this kind of field uh, and do this kind of work. And so, I'm really privileged to have him. And not only as a, a colleague and a friend in this community, but as a mentor of mine for, gosh, it's been 15 years now, my friend. So, really, uh, thanks for coming out tonight. I'm going to hand the mic to Jim. I'm going to the program. So, thanks, Jim. So whatever your expectations are, check them out a notch because it's, it's not all that great what I have to say. But hopefully from our perspective, from a village manager perspective, I've been in Lincoln County for 15 years. Five years with uh, Commissioner Tim Bug back there. I gave him my first job here in Lincoln County and then 10 years in the great community of Johnstown. So uh, what they asked me to do was put together some uh, real world scenarios of, of what we do in the village and what, how we try to uh, manage this growth that is a freight track growing now and, and we are laying directly on the track. So um, it's very important to us, uh, four council members are here, our village planners here, so it's very important uh, the uh, seriousness of what we're uh, potentially dealing with here in the, in the near future. So uh, hopefully no one's offended by what I said. Hopefully this is just my opinions and what we found that works. Uh, I, I touch on the schools a little bit, not from a funding standpoint, but from a, uh, a urban myth standpoint about density and how many students come in and, and whatnot. So um, these are just my opinions. I hope you can take them back and, and are able to utilize something that I say tonight, hopefully. And um, Jim and, and Joe, you guys would like this. So uh, this just proves a point that people have internal biases no matter what. So, you know, people that move into the community two, two years prior, or coming out to the opposition meeting of, of presenting. So, in 2018, UCLA did a study about why people don't like development. It's because they have a, uh, a bias towards developers that they're going to make money. It's not ultimately traffic or straight services or schools. That's kind of the guise of why people come out sometimes. It's the fact that Jim is going to put a million bucks in his pocket and go to the wayside and, and forget about Johnstown and the community. So that's not 
to take the side of the developer by any means. It just proves that there's bias out there. People are sometimes jealous and, and it kind of roots itself in these other areas of traffic and noise and other things. But in the end, they just don't want to see someone else make money. So there's some jealousy in there. So ultimately, when I was putting this together, you know, why does the community need to grow? Ultimately, you know, sometimes in our planning commission meetings, people were saying, oh, we're fine just the way we are. Absolutely, we're a great community, and when I say we, I mean Johnston. So, four bosses. So, it's really important to grow because if you're not, but you have to control your own future. So, if you're just stagnant, everybody's going to be growing around you. You're actually dying. So, if you think about it, if, uh, for instance, Johnstown, uh, speaking of freight trains, New Albany doing great jobs of what they're doing. They are heading our way. No secret, I'll tell, you know, it's just no secret. So if we don't know as a community, specifically us, again, this could be something to your community, it could mean nothing to your community. You have to grow, because someone is going to grow, and if you're not growing, you're gonna be surrounded by somebody else. You have no control, I have no control, council has no control of what the city of world is doing. We all play nice and we share information. Yeah, that's great, but we don't control our destiny if somebody else is controlling it for us. So it's really important, you have to grow. It has to be planned growth, it has to be smart growth, it can't be just, you know, willy-nilly. Obviously the schools are affected, so you've got to take that into consideration, but you have to grow, you have to grow responsibly. How much time do that? Um, so ultimately, you know, with growth, we need jobs, and we need labor, and we need people to work in those, those uh, manufacturing facilities. Johnstown is uh, really close to opening our second manufacturing facility, or not manufacturing facility, our second business park in a congestion of Port Authority. So ultimately, when we're talking to people, they don't even care about qualified labor. <laughs> they just need a body that is able to be trained, that shows up on time, that maybe lives close to the, the business in which they work, and they will train them. They'll, they'll spend money. They'll do that. They just need someone to show up regularly on time. So, with our unemployment, which is a great thing, it's also a bad thing when you have employers coming to you saying, "Okay, Jim, I have 300 jobs that are open. That's that's an exaggeration. I have 30 jobs open uh, in a couple of our facilities. I need people. So, where do these people come from? And, and if everybody takes the the notion of, well, we're, they're not going to come to jobs, they're not going to come to Granville, they're not going to come to Albany." But they don't come. But obviously, Jennifer just said they are coming. So we have to be able to plan proactively for that. From a municipality standpoint, sorry, we need those income tax dollars because we have expectations to provide the parks, we have expectations to uh, install storm sewer. If you saw videos from last Wednesday, our, there's no storm sewer that can handle that, and we do not pay for basement storms. <laughs> But what we do, there's expectations by our residents, right? So we have to have funds in order to do that. So as I mentioned before, we're creating a second business park to help generate those funds. So right here, just in two years, here's uh, some income tax numbers. Uh, we were up 161,000 on your business employees, so people working here, we do not have credit. Uh, so we also tax those people that live elsewhere, but that was up 150,000, based purely on numbers of people living in our community. We're doing about 25 new homes a year. So it's also directly correlated to the labor market. You know, people are having to pay higher wages, so we see 1%. Uh, that's another topic of 1%. People want everything. 1% uh, doesn't cut it. So it's also easier to keep an existing business. So when, when they come to us and say, we're working on a big project in the village council, we want to keep that existing business. If we can funnel that tax dollars back into, this, into our system to provide those places that people want to live and work, then it's just secular and you get everybody wants. So we, we mentioned, uh, Mr. Block, council member mentioned the cluster development, Jim mentioned it. You know, those, creating those pockets of population density, I think, are key because it, it I'll touch on it a little bit later, it reduces the amount of money that the developers have to pay for or pay, pay uh, the infrastructure it also has to reduce 
the amount of money we have to pay as a municipality to replace that aging infrastructure. So it's really important that if you work to cluster those populations, uh, you can maybe, I'm just saying maybe, specifically mm -hmm. address the affordable housing, transportation, and walkability and component of what the demographics are looking for today. Uh, density, uh, I think now we're taking seven, seven times density is mentioned. Density is not a bad thing. Again, you have to control growth. We have to have maybe a mixed use. But your community, first and foremost, has to identify what density is. You know, density in the short north is different than density in downtown Johnston. So you as a community, we as a community, have to identify what is acceptable to our community. So through the comprehensive plan, I can uh, have that, you know, that's probably, I would assume, you know, so you've got to make sure you know what you want as a community. But just examples, these are some around Johnstown. These are, this is the uh, Liberty Bridge Estates, you know, three to four uh, homes per acre. No, that's wrong. Three to four acres per home. I mean, what's up with it? I apologize. <laughs> so, you know, that's your typical. That's yeah. <laughs> uh, this is in Johnstown. The other one was on the outskirts, but this is a traditional suburb type development. And that's got some walkability to it, connected to town, and then, you know, uh, the work partner. You know, it's very you know, fun to say at a public meeting. So, you know, <laughs> you've got to figure out what it is your community individually wants. Uh, like I said, I said I was going to touch on schools. You know, density is going to, you know, pull the system. And, uh, we have a great school system in Johnstown. We have two brand new buildings. We have a renovated football, the whole shoot match. It's, it's wonderful. It's awesome. It's top notch. People want that. You know, people see that in other communities and say, oh, Johnstown, you know what you're doing. We're going to try and get a piece of that. And so with density, you've got to make sure you understand the actual um, impact, at least from my opinion of it. And council members have seen these before. But so your school districts, and this is a tool, this is something you could ask your school district to help you with, to see where exactly those kids are living. So they'll, they can give you a list. Our, our school district was gracious enough to, to give me non-identifiable uh, information, just purely addresses. The wonderful uh, auditor's office at the county was able to geolocate everything. So we knew where our, where our students were because we were dealing with a pretty uh, hot topic of development and, and density and, and schools are going to be overrun. So I said, okay, well, let's figure out where our students live. So we did that. And this is old data 2017. So what we found, and these are a few of the uh, neighborhoods, uh, the highest density, no group states had eight students in six units. That's drastically changed, so that's a, don't worry about that. And four of those students was one family. Um, if you look, I mean, it's hard to see. The last, the least dense for the school districts were multifamily units. So we had Cotter Run, or Leafy Dell Apartments, Cotter Run Apartments, Concord Condos, Leafy Dell Condos. One person that lived in Leafy Dell Condos, one student, excuse me, that lived in Leafy Dell Condos. So this is just an idea as, you know, when people were saying this probably two, three meetings, you know, there's going to be, uh, you know, 800 kids in these units. Well, let's see where they're at now. It's our multifamily producing the students that is supposedly said to have been packed. Today, no or actually 2017. But um, there's a flip side to it. You know, what, what's the residential uh, uh, tax rate? What's the tax rate on it? You know, what are they producing? You know, single families are producing more taxes. So there's more to this conversation, but at least this is a tool you can find, um, hopefully with your school district, or you can use your school district and the auditors to, uh, uh, I won't volunteer, I have a shape. Is he good at one? You can call him and he will, what? Uh, he will uh, do that to you. So in 2017, we did it out of curiosity, um, boredom, whatever. Oh, no, it's not more interesting. <laughs> uh, I re ran the numbers from the school district uh, two years uh, So October 2017 and then April 2019. Just to see, we, we, like I said, we're doing 25 units uh, in the village. That doesn't include the rest of the school district. We went from 53.12 living in the village, 53% of the students living in the village, to 53.22. <laughs> it, it, you know, it, it, um, 
what's the word? It rose equally. So people living in the village, people living out of the village, were producing the same amounts. My point is, it's not just a village problem. I know council will probably be backing up on this. It's a township issue. Township also has to look at, you know, their zoning, their compliance to make sure the schools uh, potentially are affected. So again, that was more, you know, the other one was kind of uh, township and or the village and the density. You know, there's just as many students outside the village as there is inside. So here's a, a, a few tools, uh, the comprehensive plan, the zoning ordinance, infrastructure planning, and innovation. So um, we talked about this already. This is kind of a visual of what uh, Councilman Block had mentioned. You know, kind of cluster that neighborhood together, shrink down the, the uh, footprint of the infrastructure, shrink down the, the maintenance costs, the installation costs, maybe potentially, hopefully, lower the cost of, of those housing units. And then people can obviously enjoy the, the open space without having to you know, maintain it themselves. You know, they to do it. So there is some uh, good to come of this uh, development. Infrastructure planning. Um, know what your infrastructure is. Know what you need to fix it. And then tell people, such as developers, such as legislators, such as whoever will listen, of what you need to help fix that road. Uh, the mayor talked about, you know, it took 20 years. Yes, they do take 20 years to update sometimes. Also, when you have an updated plan, you'll score better on applications. So in 2014, um, that's very hard to see, but basically we took intersection by intersection, segment by segment, and grade every road in the village. And the higher ones you will see today are paved, are reconstructed. We did it with um, some objectivity, but we had to had to put our local knowledge into it as well. And it's not perfect, it's, there is some subjectivity to it, but um, Concord Road, Oregon Street, Main Street are the big ones that uh, you would see if you could read it on the left hand side. So, <laughs> know what you got, know what you got. That way, you know, if, if this council wants this and the other council wants that, at least the, the new council will know what the old council is thinking. Uh, we talked about aging in place. You know, we uh, we want to do that. We want a community where you know you don't have to go to New Albany, Newark, wherever, Granville to, to get condo. You want to stay with your grandbabies. You want to stay and watch them grow up with them. So, creating a plan for aging in place. Uh, we had not done that. City of Dublin has a pretty robust one, but that's just how we're going to address this baby boomer and, and grandma and grandpa staying here. It's kind of a circle of life. And, as you know, I have an eight-year-old and a six-year-old. Basically, it's all I do. So. <laughs> uh, Park and Rec, what we did, planning, again, uh, businesses want to see amenities in which their employees can use and enjoy. Uh, so our Parks and Rec committee, uh, a few of which are here tonight, really put an emphasis on, I think our budget a few years ago was like eight grand, and that was to pay for some uh, lighting and some porta jobs. You know, our park and rec budget is pretty slim even to this day, but we're doing great things with it with the help of uh, folks like the TJ Evans Foundation purchasing property for us. So it's really important, you know, employers want to know that their employees can go do something after work's over. So we uh, knew somebody over at Ohio State and they brought in their master's class and did this studio project for us for the great price of nothing. and. A very good plan. It has implementation steps in it. It has some diagrams of, of parked uh, facilities that we have that you know may be dressed up, and we're implementing this. We're doing good things, so it doesn't hurt to ask people about you know other resources. Again, you know, this is probably a twenty-five thousand dollar plan. If I put a title on it, but luckily we just ask around. And, uh, you can figure out something for free. That's great. So we implement that as well. Or currently. Um, that slide got that stuck. What it is supposed to be is be invented, think big. So, a few years ago, uh, the state authorized the legalization of medical marijuana, and we had an individual come to us. And I got to think if it was a different council, that the information or the decision would have been different. But our council at that time said, "Okay, let's let's talk about it." And so we did talk about medical marijuana for about eighteen months. Um, 
we did our research, we called people, we visited people, we made sure it was something we wanted to do, but it was non-traditional uh, by any stretch of the imagination. So we were luckily the first, uh, first community in Ohio not to prohibit it. If you followed the law, you as a community you could prohibit it. Uh, we did not, and in fact, we came out and said, no, we want this industry in our, in our backyard. Um, we, we got a lot of press. Uh, I called my wife and said, hey, I just got to keep up marijuana times. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think she answered really good. So, but uh, it gave John Sounds a point. Even if it didn't matter, if, if marijuana didn't come to Johnstown, which did, we still got out there. We still got our name out there that we're a business that's willing to take risks, that we're, we're, we're a community willing to take risks, and look uh, at other options instead of just your typical. Um, other manufacturing facilities. So uh, we had two new businesses, three licenses in the village. We had one time uh, price of land in the business park. Uh, they were all taken by options. I think it was like 75 grand an acre. Where if you would have called right before we passed that resolution, you probably could have got it for 20 grand an acre. So you really saw a lot of uh, a lot of money start flowing. And you know we. We anticipate 35 new jobs in the next year. $40,000 in income tax, that's very conservative. I would be surprised if that's not much, much higher. So um, we took a risk. We looked in our own back and actually in our backyard looked at us and we said yes and we had a discussion. But you know, if some, some oddball comes to you, don't turn it away, at least investigate it, take a look at what you got. Um, I know a lot of these acronyms were already thrown out there, but these are some other things given to communities by the Ohio Advice Code that you can utilize to help control costs when it comes to population and economic development. So, um, downtown new development district is different than the downtown revitalization district. Anybody know? So, downtown, I'm sorry, I'll just keep going. Downtown new development district um, is basically a tip that money can be used for interior improvements to buildings. So if you want to look at that, um, that's uh, authorized by the Ohio Chair. It's only two or three years old, if I remember. The Downtown Revitalization District is a district in which you can get more liquor licenses than regulatory allowed by per capita. So, Boozen. Speaking of Boozen, Adora. Speaking of Adora. I talk about Dora all the time. Both my kids and two people and my colleagues, they both have their meetings. But uh, downtown outdoor refreshment area, you can walk around publicly uh, with open containers of alcohol, not liquor or wine, I believe. Uh, but that's just an option you can to do individually within your community something different that sets you apart from everybody else. Tax Economic Financing, Joint Economic Development District, Johnstown's currently negotiating one right now. Uh, Community Improvement Corporation, we just uh, did the authorizing legislation. So we're trying to not replace Nate and Taylor, but to supplement them in ways that they're not willing to go down the path. Um, our Johnstown CIC will do that. So I had a couple others, but I'm done. Um, so there's organizations, most of which are here, you know, from a Licking County standpoint, uh, Licking County Transportation Improvement Districts, LCATS, Keith, North Lincoln County Port Authority, Girl Lincoln County, Ocean New York, Syntax, APC, Ohio Lincoln Jobs Lincoln County. If you have any questions, I can guarantee somebody here is going to have an answer or know someone that knows someone that can get you an answer. So um, I would definitely uh, make a note of, of you know, there, there's someone in here in this room or, or in this community that can help you. This was in a dispatch yesterday. I think this is my last one. Fourth, third hottest housing market in July. Um, I mean, it is what it is. So if it's coming, it's here. Uh, we just have to be prepared for it. So I love this one. You can't tell me what to do with my carpet. Mm -hmm. What do you mean you can't tell what they would just stop that? <laughs> <laughs> we get that all the time. <laughs> I have a warped sense of humor when it comes to urban planning. Uh, if you have any questions, by all means, Give me a call, I'll help out when I can. That's all I have. So I promised everyone to be pretty sharp and be out of here, but Jim talked long. So, any questions for Jim? I'll go all the time. That was Mark.
he got first. <laughs> uh, don't think you're going to come and take Jim away from us because he's high maintenance. <laughs> uh, I've been in and around Johnstown Magic since 1960. And since Mr. Laird came on board and the new council members, not just me, the others, we worked together good and Johnstown's in better shape than I've ever seen. Them. And I think it's a great future there. It just starts a little bit deeper to see more of happen. And with Jim, we appreciate it a lot. Jim, one of the challenges that, at least from the housing industry perspective, is you go into a community and people will, you know, the thought is we need to hold this land for um, commercial development because so much of what we do is based on income tax revenue. It's the way our state is structured. What are some creative ways to kind of marry um, and maybe solve this problem? Is it through something like a regional jet or, or something like that to not penalize where somebody lives in the community that they live in? Yeah, I mean, you can do something like that, sorry. Um, so I think it's really important for the community to know what those commercial places are. Um, and if that's the comprehensive plan of zoning ordinance for you. So it's really important you gotta identify, I mentioned identify density, you gotta identify where you think your commercial's gonna be, you gotta identify where your manufacturing is gonna be, and stick to your gun on that, you know, don't don't deviate because it seems to be it's just a melee and, and you know it's a lot less than there. So I don't know if that answered your question. Well, I was thinking more, some communities will say, uh, Let's take Dublin on the northwest side of Franklin County. Uh, a lot of communities have this belief that Dublin has all of the commercial activity, but they're just as fine with all of their the employees for those places living elsewhere. Uh, yeah, that's, a, that's not a myth. I mean, I think that's a lot of well. And, and so I, I hope through the public, through this presentation, that it shows that we, we as a community, Charles Town, whatever, need those residents to stay put, not just work there, but contribute to the community, contribute to this, the, the small society of, of whatever community they're in, as well as the larger one. And then, um, not, it, it's like no one wants the housing, but well, the housing's got to go somewhere. And, and obviously, we as a community, the leadership of the community has to ensure that it's done correctly and it's done methodically and plain. So, um, I think, Communities have to accept the, the good, which is the jobs with the bad, which is the, <laughs> the uh, residents. Because, uh, you know, retail, we didn't even talk about retail, but we uh, in Johnstown, everybody wants some all these, they bought that and it's uh, no more auto parts stores or banks or pizza shops. <laughs> so <laughs> when we go to all these, which our zoning inspector has done many times, Come back and you got about five thousand more rooftops. You know, and so okay, well if I get five thousand more rooftops, I'll lose my job because no one wants rooftops, so you know all this. You know, so people gotta understand you, you can't have the good and the good, you gotta have the good with that. Not saying it doesn't. You forgot who it is. Huh? <laughs> Everyone did. You forgot who it is. I'm gonna give you back to Councilor Blake and we'll a highlight for folks. This is a demographic number. Uh, Lincoln County has 22,000 and change individuals come to our county daily from work. We lose about 47,000 daily to the other starting counties for work. This is a lot more than what's happening to Thank you, Nate. Thank you for the program crafting uh, offer tonight. And Jim, I'm just curious, uh, you know, tonight we talked about from the beginning speaker to the panel to your presentation, Talk about the growth that's coming in Lincoln County, Central Ohio. Talk about the intersection of schools, the, the housing. How do you see, and you mentioned at the beginning of your presentation, of trying to expand the labor market. And I'm curious about how we're um, intersecting social services into what, uh, to what's happening here in the community. I want to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, social services, I think, is probably the one I'm most unfamiliar with. But I think it's probably the most important at this point because of the, the issues we're currently dealing with with opioids and, and whatnot. But um, communities have to be in touch with those service providers. You know, I, I marked out 
qualified because you know qualified is falling off the face of the earth. There's, there's no such thing. Um, but they have to be involved in, in the conversation because you know if someone comes up to me and says, hey, you know, I'm losing X amount of employees because of substance abuse or something like that. I got to know where to send that employer. I got to know, you know, is there ways to get uh, those people in touch with the correct services? Because maybe they just don't know. So, like I said, I'm very unfamiliar with the actual inner workings of social services, but at least point people, point businesses, point organizations to those those that help. But I think it's a very important cog in this whole machine. Well, with that, we're gonna wrap. So I really want to thank Jim. I want to thank our panelists. I want to thank uh, Jennifer for taking your time this evening. Uh, a couple of real quick things of housekeeping. Uh, the presentations will be sent out probably in the next two days, maybe even Monday. Just watch for your emails if you registered online. Uh, we'll have them sent in the Dropbox or something along with the survey. Uh, give us some feedback. We'd love to understand what you thought was valuable this, this evening, what you thought wasn't. Jim. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was very fun. Uh, and so we love that feedback and understand we, we like to always understand this was a this topic tonight was we received 35 comments last year all about population and how to how do you balance it. So that's why this this happened this year. So we'd love to have some of that feedback in the next year's program. Um, I want to thank everyone for coming out tonight. I especially want to thank and looking in the room, we have a number of our local investors who are supporting us, but for you this type of program does not happen. So I want to thank you all very personally um, for coming out and supporting Rose and County Community Improvement Corporation. Um, we are a nonprofit, and so but for our investors and but for our partners, we can't have these moments, we can't share these programs, we want to have an opportunity to have this discussion. Now my challenge, go back, go to your communities, start the conversation. And if we can help in any way, shape, or form at Rose and County to further facilitate those conversations, to bring data to those conversations, to bring resources to those conversations. We will. So please go on with the information. Thank you so much for your time tonight and have a nice night.